Hi and welcome to episode three of On The Money with Ask Paul Donaghy. I'm going to be joined today with David Sweeney, uh, Sweeney Solicitors. We're going to have a quick chat around all things you think you need to know from the legal process in relation to buying a house, selling a house, mortgages, applications. And we're also going to touch on the importance of will, wills. Uh, so David, thanks very much for joining me today. Uh, pleasure to have you here. Uh, uh, Paul, uh, looking forward you. to this one. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah. Uh, I must say, this uh, the poshest hotel I've ever been in. <laughs> the poshest studio yeah. set I've ever been. Yeah, thanks I know very you much. came on uh, our podcast, the Sweeney Show, previously. Yeah, we did. Uh, thank you very much for your time back then. Yeah, no and like, um, yeah, I think the the property market at the moment is quite strange, isn't it? It is. Yeah, we get a lot of questions from people, David. I suppose from. Uh, quite a more basic question people are asking me is, is it a good time to buy or is it a bad time to buy? Yeah. So we we'll start off the interview and having a quick chat around that. What do you think? Yeah. I know you're based in Cork, but you do cover yeah. the whole country. We do, yeah. We've, uh, we've an office in Dublin as well. Yeah. It, it's it's strange. You know, it's kind of just pockets of, of activity throughout yeah. the year, especially in Cork where the suburbs, like just house and estate has been finished. But the predominantly the, uh, I suppose, the prime person or that, person who's buying a house now is a couple in their 30s. It seems yeah. to be that professional. Yeah. And that's because the purchase price has been driven up. Where say, take for example in Cork, maybe even two years ago, you might have bought a house, a nice semi-D, three bed, for 240, 220. Yeah. That's gone now. That house is now yeah. 290. You it's know, mad, 300. And so what that means is that the earning capacity of that person, as you know, to get that mortgage of 90% yeah. of that, uh, is just not there anymore. Uh, so it's it seems that, the, yes, there are houses have been built, but the person who can actually buy that house has been narrowed because yeah. they've been priced out of the market. Right, okay. Uh, and it's, it's a combination of things also. The stock just isn't there, or it's mm. coming and it's quite slow. Uh, I think the auctioneers as well, why they are a valuable part of the property chain, I, I, I think they're putting the properties on the market just below an asking price to get attention, yeah. but they know that they're going to achieve you know, 20, more, 30, yeah. 40,000. The 000. seller's expectations higher than the buyer coming yeah, in. Yeah, people it, are getting a bit... Yeah, pissed off with that really correct. Well, yeah. And it's, it's very unfair to a purchaser because if you see a house uh, advertise at 275 mm-hmm. and you think, great, I mean, that's in my budget. Mm. But the minute you start, you put in your bid at maybe 273, 270, 280, 285, you know, it's gone yeah. up, it's, it's just gone away, gone away from you straight away. So, one of the questions on that, and you'll probably best serve to answer this, we do the mortgage applications that ask Paul quite well, but from a legal point of view, what are you seeing as the average kind of time frame? That's what we get asked quite a lot. What is the average time it's yeah. taken? from when you start the process, I forget about us from the kind of the financial planner piece of view and getting the, and the, getting the mortgage, uh, that's almost the, 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 not the easiest part, but the first part. Yeah. When they land on your doorstep, when yeah. should they be contacting you? So when should, have, when yeah. should the first, let's take a first time buyer, so yeah. no other sales involved, they're just buying the first house. Yeah. How long, how much notice do you need and when do you want to hear from those type of clients? Yeah. Like it's kind of chicken and egg. People kind of, usually they, see, they drive by to see a house they want, to, they want to purchase, say a house estate in an area that they want to live in. Uh, they contact the auctioneer, they engage with the auctioneer in their bidding process, yeah. and then when they go sit, usually then, once they've gone sale agreed, so say the house has gone sale agreed at 320,000, yeah. the auctioneer then takes what's called a booking deposit, five or 10,000 euro, that's a fully refundable pro- uh, uh, deposit. deposit, until you sign the contract, okay. and that just takes the property off the market, tells the auctioneer that, yeah, we have We're a serious, serious purchase yeah. here, the auctioneer then informs the vendor, the selling solicitor, the issue the contracts, planning, title, building regulation. To and that's when they need sister. someone to send that to. And that's usually the trigger then for purchasers that the auctioneer says, oh, who's your solicitor? Because okay. you've gone, because people, you, you know what it is, it's just human nature. When you want to buy your house, you're just really concerned about location and budget. Yeah. You know, where is it close to school, is it close to my family? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it's budget, can I afford that? Um, so the solicitor kind of comes down the, the kind of chain at the start of the process in the right. purchaser's mind. Until but they I, get asked the question. I would advise they should be ringing solicitors today. If you want to buy a house in the next year, you should buy, ring a solicitor today because A, it'll, it'll help your budget. Okay. Uh, when you actually engage with a solicitor, ring, and buy, you should ring around, get quotes. Yeah. And like there is a ballpark, you know, of what's a reasonable fee. Right. There are solicitors, like in any industry, do things for very cheaply. and. There's solicitors then that merit, you know, a, yeah. a larger fee. Service, is, they yeah, pay for service, yeah. service is fine. It's not just about price. There's other yeah. things in, in fact have been there. So if you are shopping around, there's three things to be to in particular for a, in broad strokes for solicitor's fee. One is the solicitor's fee itself. So that's the the, the charge the solicitor charges he or she to carry out the legal work, and that would be when they get the contracts in. So it's gone sale agreed. They receive the contracts. So, the, so this yeah. the, 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 is this the is this the conveyancing part then? This is conveyancing. So this is conveyancing. So, so what, con- conveyancing is just a fancy word for property. So right. conveyancing is the legal word for buying and selling property. Okay. Whether that's residential, commercial, whether it's a lease or whatever it might be. Okay. So they hold. So say you have like criminal law, family law. The property, the heading for that is conveyancing. Oh, that's okay. what that word. So that's what you're paying your sister yeah. for is that part. That's conveyancing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then 
in that legal, uh, I suppose, that engagement of having your solicitor for that part of it, so they, first of all, it's called title. So the person selling the house must be entitled to sell the house. Must, yes. must, must be own it and entitled to sell it on. And there's a, sometimes a couple of quirks there. Just say uh, the person who's selling an inherited house through probate, so say an yeah. aunt or parent, something tragic to happen like that, and they inherit it that, that way. That house has to go through a probate process. where right. the, you know, pass the title on to the niece correct, or the nephew. Yeah. So it would be case. either... And then the beneficiaries of the will or someone that's entitled to the property in the Succession Act with Mexican or something like that. So that process might take a year. So that it can still go to market, but we must wait for the person to actually get the probate right, okay. to actually transfer ownership. Um, the there might be a situation where we, we see this quite frequently because there's uh, the property market is quite stagnant for seven or eight years there. So people yeah. who might have been single when they bought their house now married yes. and then they're selling on as a married couple and that, that can raise little quirks if you say if I had a house and before I met my wife and now we're now selling as a married couple the title is still in my name the mortgage might be still in my name or maybe you remortgage jointly and the, really what happens there is the non uh, title spouse they must sign a separate form called spousal consent and that's just oh, to protect okay. that spouse because in so certain family home uh, correct yeah, yeah. family home yeah. decoration yeah and all, all property transactions since like 95 since the family law legislation came in okay. has to be supported by family law decoration and that really means if you're married both spouses are aware of and consent to the sale and if you're okay. single you're saying that listen there's not a spouse that has to be uh, uh, brought Consider. into this consideration right, okay. this conversation Very good. Um, so that's the solicitor fee like the solicitor fee it's like everything it ranges I would put a ballpark 1800 2000 euro okay. it's usually a good starting range and obviously right. th that's Depend up and down the and that would be up in around the house any house up to about maybe two hundred fifty thousand euro, and up to that, then it depends on you know the actual type of the title and what's involved in it. Okay. Um, the second part of then is stamp duty to the government, uh, the revenue commissioners, and the solicitor pays that for you when you might, the day you get your keys. So the solicitor acts as a revenue collector. There. They're an agent. Yeah. They're an agent. So yeah. that, that's really Basically. what it is. And like, there's, there's no title. benefit title. to the solicitor yeah, for doing no, it. Yeah, no, it's madness. Yeah. Um, so when you're ringing around and, and getting your codes for the solicitor, I suppose if you haven't gone sale agreed, it's very hard for the solicitor to say, uh, "God, you're going to buy this house in six months for." 315,000. Yeah. So they'll probably give you a ballpark, sorry, not a ballpark, you'll tell them what price, your price range is. So we'll give you the, the fixed price, price range for the house. For the house, yeah. yeah. So say at 320,000, stamp duty is 1%. So your yeah. revenue bill is going to be 3,200 euro. Now, obviously, yeah. if you go sale agreed at 315, that comes down yeah, and fluctuates, yeah, whatever yeah, yeah. it is. Now, there's a slight variation on that. <laughs> and this can get very complicated <laughs> for if you're buying a new house. Because okay. what the government say is that. So just yeah. when you're buying a new house, is the conveyance and not as hard for a solicitor to do because it's oh, off a bill. Oh, is it? Yeah, because it's it's, there's actually two parts of it. So when you buy a new house, there's actually a site. So you purchase the site, and then ah. you hire the builder on the billing agreement. So it becomes an employer. I was going to ask you people get a discount then off the bill because they're putting a new house was less complex. Come on, <laughs> you put me on the spot here. <laughs> no, it's actually even. like well, but yeah, so there's I more work. I didn't realize yeah, that. Yeah, but then. also when you're actually a new build, so because generally with a new build, the developer and the auctioneer. They want to sell that house and estate before they've even broken ground or it might be at foundation level. So the solicitor might have to engage with the purchaser for 12 months or mm. longer, depending on the build and the delays and whatever phase. Right, that, okay. Because I had a lady contacted us recently. She's buying a house and her, her house is in phase three and they're only starting to build phase two now. So she's not going to get her keys to maybe April yeah. 2020. But that means you might have to engage with that person for the next 12 months yes, uh, yeah. until they actually get their keys. Um, but just going and no, normally on a say you saw the house and it's a built house second hand yeah. house hopefully from the time you go your booking deposit to you get your keys in six weeks right that, that, that's dependent and we're getting sidetracked here in a few things but no. that's dependent on whether the person living in the house owning is living in it and they have somewhere to move themselves okay there might be a tenant in it yeah. say you bought a rental house and there's like there's certain laws to protect tenants uh, the longer they're in the property, basically, the more notice they have to give, and that can be up to like three months. This some is stage. brilliant. So we're not going. I know we're going to slightly off here, but it's brilliant because we want the viewers watching this video yeah. to realise that they think when they see a house and they buy it, the yeah. solicitor is just there to well, like, sign a couple it. of pages no, yeah. uh, and charge money, yeah. and it's very easy. Yeah. But like you said, yeah. those three yeah. or four things you've mentioned, and I, and I a, a, a dead relative, a, yeah. a, a, a rental, a tenant, yeah. uh, or somebody that is waiting for another house to close, and or a new build that has mm. those conditions. So it is actually quite a complex thing to do is mm. to buy property. Oh yeah, and I, I find the third one is nearly the worst because it's stressful. If you're buying a house and the sellers have to buy somewhere else, and say you're upgrading or downsizing yourself, so you're selling and buying, there's a real combination, like three or four solicitors. It it can't. That's the most stressful time because I think there's that people expect a six weeks turnaround. It doesn't yeah. happen because there's just a domino effect of certain things. We mentioned there just on stamp duty previously yeah. for the first time buyer. Just one other thing I want to mention there. It's currently available for the government. It, there's there's a relief available if you're a first time buyer. Okay. And we've had this recently where if, if it's a couple, you know, buying the house, both parties have to be first time buyers. So we had one right. recently where. 
uh, a couple, male and female, and the lady had inherited a third of her family home, and she's disqualified now yeah. because of it. And it's quite beneficial, and you know, it, it, there is a good financial reward in it or help from the government. So the Help to Buy scheme is for new houses and for first-time buyers. It's five percent of the build, mm -hmm. up to nineteen and a half thousand euro. So like that's potentially if you're if you're like saving for your house and you usually it's ten percent in mortgage ninety percent, um the government will now give you five percent. Yeah, very good. So you're just saving that five percent of your own funds. That's for new builds. That was it. Has to be new house. New build. Yeah. And you have to you have to qualify yourself, and you go right. on to the Help to Buy the HTB. Uh, and then the builder as well that you bought the house for, he has to be registered for the help to buy right, as well. Very good. And then the most builders are going to be Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. It's, 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 and it's the, the government pay them directly when they come right. into the And just on this query, I get sometimes in as well, and I've, seen, I've been asked on Facebook and social media platforms, is when, how does, talk us through the help to buy, so when does that payment yeah. get made to the. Yeah. To the is the solicitor involved in that or is it directly between the government oh, yeah. and the builder? It's all it's everybody. So my, sorry, so my set so I'm just going to hit my mic. So let's just talk me through that again, David. Yeah. So let's say we have a help the boy scheme. When does the actual solicitor or when does the actual builder get paid that money from the government? And how does it work for the buyer? Let's yeah. take it myself, my wife are going to buy you the house, we're first time buyers, and we're taking the help the boy, and uh, the five percent is in between the thresholds and we're good to go. Yeah. Talk me through how we do it. When, when, yeah. what, so, what's that look and feel like? So I think the first part is that you go online and see do you qualify, and you make yeah. that application online through the revenue system, and they give you back a PIN number and an ID and all this kind of thing. That means you've been approved. And, and that's revenue.ie. Yeah, right. Okay, that's, revenue. It's actually a great website. Great. You know, we're really using fantastic website. Yeah, uh, really informative. And then I suppose you then you kind of have that in the background, so you know you qualify, and then you go find your house. It's kind of one or mm. the other which comes first. You somebody to find the house and then see did they qualify, or maybe it's the auctioneer has told them that you know about help to buy scheme that's out there. Yeah. Now, in an ideal world, what happens is that, so if you want to talk about the process of buying a house, so first of all, you booking a deposit. Yeah. So you put down your five or 10,000 euro we spoke about previously, auctioner takes that, probably goes yeah. off the market, contract's issued, and that's fully refundable to sign a contract. Mm -hmm. That period between booking deposit and contract signing, we call that stage two of a three-stage process. Yes. Stage one, booking deposit, stage two, contracts. Great. That's when the, 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 the solicitor does all the real hard work to graft. So he investigates the title, person selling, as we discussed earlier, is the title to sell it, planning permission, house is built within uh, planning regulations, yep. and then building regulations, uh, that the house is actually built and constructed to a, a high level, and there's an architect sort of compliance Brilliant. and declaration identity in the maps and all that. If you're buying a second, now this doesn't qualify for the help to buy scheme, but just to know, if you're buying a house built before 1963, it's a second hand house, the vendor and the solicitor selling it, they're not obligated to provide any certifications. Okay. The acts came in in 1963 and 1990 was the Building Control Act, but so which basically means that if you buy a house pre-1963, you must it's re, you must get an engineer's report, any yeah, structural yeah. survey, but before 63 it's so important. The yeah. whole deal just the whole falls on that structural yeah. survey, yeah. So we do all that, how does the money go from the yeah. revenue <coughs> to the builder, so th this and when you this pay is, your next yeah, voice? This is what I've seen, and I saw 99% I saw of the time what happens is the, when, we sp send us, when we sign our contract, you then pay 10%. So say right. the house is making nice and clean, 300,000 house. Yeah. When we sign our contract, we're going to pay 30,000 euro. Yeah. 15 from the revenue and 15 from ourselves. Yes, except, uh, correct, when the money you pay to the auctioneer, the five grand, say the five grand you can take yeah. that off. So you, yeah, you so as the individual, paid, 10, 10 grand yeah, in that so, case. And we've already yeah. paid four, five. That's 15 yeah. grand to 300 grand. Yeah. Do do I need to do anything as the as the buyer? Well, are the revenue and the builder sort yeah, that other fifteen this, well, grand? I'll just themselves. give you an example of what what have I I've experienced when this health to buy first started off. I think like everything, people kind of find themselves, and then sometimes the developer and the developer solicitors can be in a position of power. So what I experienced in one transaction where they still expected the purchaser to pay the ten percent. At oh. the contract signing, now what? There, there's a that's a huge grey area because they should be holding that as a stakeholder. What I think what happened was the builder probably needed funds to actually okay. complete the build. Um, and it wasn't very way for revenue. To pay in that circumstance, the purchasers had to go get a loan from a third party to make up the balance of the ten percent. And then when we drew it down, it was refunded back to them out of the the balance that was in their mortgage. Now that's a that, disaster. That's I only had that once, yeah, yeah. and I just felt it was completely unfair. But the the, the normal ways, that's that one. The let's, normal. The, let's give viewers the usual a little bit of hope be, here. <laughs> you would just pay over your your five percent, yeah. fifteen thousand less than five grand you already grand, paid, yeah. and then you obviously in the cover letter to the to the purchasing solicitor was was he returns the contract, yeah, no, signed the duplicate. You know this. Our couple qualifies yeah. for the help to buy. We're now re re returning the contracts with the five percent. Okay. We've all, we're all approved for the five percent, the balance, and you will pay that in closing. Mm. So then we go to the third stage, the closing stage, where if you have a mortgage, now we draw down your mortgage in the background. That's the key. Get your key stage. So the mortgage gets drawn down. Uh, the solicitor draws down the mortgage on your behalf. You've signed a the loan offer and undertaken his office or her office. Okay. And then the solicitor has a small bit more work to do as regards um, uh, the title and planning, taxes. Make sure all those are up to date. 
and then on the day you get your keys, the sister carries out uh, what's called searches. Right. So we, if it's a builder or a construction company, we search the company, search all individuals, and search the property itself. One for judgment and bankruptcy searches, this makes sure it's clean and uh, legally entitled to sell and buy property. And the second one then is the property itself, that apart from any loan declared on the property, that there's no other loans or mortgage put in last minute that we're unaware of. So what I'm getting here is there is an absolute a lot of huge work amount. to be done. A huge amount of work uh, where, to yeah, buy a property. Where, and that's a very basic, it's without anything where, going where on. Where I feel it. solicitors can fall down, and I'm like, by the grace of God, go any of us, it's probably the communication. Yeah. You know, because you agree, and, and I think there has to be three things in any, when you engage any solicitor. One, you have to obviously, you know, are they local and their reputation, all that kind of stuff, maybe you got to refer for someone else. One is agreed price, and it's fixed price from start to, it's transparency cost. Two is communication, and mm-hmm. either that's an email or a phone call, you're happy to say, listen, I want to call return the same day, or can you just give me an email once a week, just to let me know where it's at, is nothing's happened last week, and do I need ex- to bring the option here? My experience with people contacting me and ask Paul, whether it's Facebook or email, is that they fall down solicitors, oh, sorry, I'm not saying it's financial advisors and the yeah. banks for mortgages, yeah. that the punter, the customer, the end guy, always feels let down from yeah. the lack of communication. And it's, yeah. That when they meet a solicitor mm. or a financial advisor or anybody in this yeah. game, for the first time, yeah. it's all bells and whistles, we yeah. do everything, fees agreed, yeah. then it all goes quiet. Yeah. And yeah. they're panicking because it's yeah. such an emotional boy or emotional and think, stage. Yeah. And, I, and I guarantee you, it, uh, 99% of the time, it's not that the file hasn't been worked, yeah. it's just hasn't been, hasn't been communicated. Hasn't been I guarantee there's yeah. been loads of work yeah. coming yeah, yeah, through yeah, yeah. And they might be letter, may, waiting for a letter for like, the bond in place from the local county council, yeah. something with the planning, a map might be done, had to be amended. Yeah. There's always, like, and because in, in your case, the, in, in your practice, you guys try to get back to clients again. Uh, yeah, we try to update everybody at half ten every, every Friday morning. Do so you? just weekly, yeah, Brilliant. we just have to do it by email. Okay, that's excellent. And it, it's just, it's just, it's just a nice way to communicate with people yeah. and they're expecting to come back to us. And then the third element is efficiency of service. So efficiency of service. Right. Like in this day and age, most solicitors must have a must have a really good document management system. Yeah. Uh, we use a system called Expediate Document Management oh, yeah. System. Declan Brannigan, he's a new product out now as well called Trade Legal, and that just makes us a, a paper free office. I have the office ac- access on my phone if you want to, you know, and it just means information is there all the time. It's quicker. It's right, email. Okay. Um, and would you would you ask if if somebody's watching this video today or thinking about getting a solicitor? What would be the three things then you would, uh, uh, kind of getting them from you already, but well, in summary for our viewers, yeah. what would be the three questions you would ask yeah. a solicitor yeah. if you were now going to buy with your wife? Yeah. Uh, what would you ask a solicitor before you make a decision on yeah. going with that firm? Yeah, well, one, they have to be qualified. Do they have a yeah. dedicated conveyancing department? Two, you must agree prices, and that's over and back, and it's fixed price up front, full transparency, and you should get the solicitor fee plus the VAT, the okay. revenue fee, the, the registration fees, the land so registry. So full cost of everything. Full Cost, yeah, and that's so it's not saying two grand, then it turns to be three because yeah. it was land registry. Yeah, or they don't include the VAT and this. Get okay. it on writing, and you're all pre-agreed. You're right. all to start. Very good advice. Second one asked about, you know, how often am I going to communicate it? Am I going to get a phone call or return the same day? And there's a big one that people don't ask. Mm. I think that's where they get let yeah. down with their solicitor, yeah. let down with the service because they yeah. maybe expect that. Yeah, they think it's going to happen. It doesn't. They don't ask it either. So that's yeah. a big tip. So yeah. uh, it's uh, great for you watching the yeah, video. Yeah, you know. We're all just human beings at the end of the day, and yeah. you know it's all human nature. But like within reason, like a, a client is entitled to an update. Yeah. You know when when if you pre agreed it as well that yeah. um and then the third thing I suppose is just be you know is the is it a modern practice what mm-hmm. document management system have they got um yeah like there's a lot in it okay like there's a, there's a huge amount in it you like you need to be really comfortable really sure because. And also, I suppose you should ask, you know, what's the expected timeline? When will I get my keys? Because that's really what everybody mm-hmm. wants to know. I put my, we've been saving now for 12 months. We yeah. moved in with it's the in-laws. It's such an emotional thing to do. We, we found the house. So, yeah. We put the booking deposit. We want the key. I thought you said it'd be next week. Yeah, yeah, there's yeah, just yeah, a management yeah. expectation there as well. Um, well yeah, very good. So yeah, uh, top three things, excellent. Yeah, well, yeah, there's, there's, there's a few more. 30, yeah. three. <laughs> can, I, can I just go back on what we hit on there just about the stamp duty and new yeah. build? Because there's a slight saving for people. So if your house is 300,000 and you bought a second-hand property, yeah. your stamp duty is 1% of that, which is mm-hmm. 3,000. If it's a new build uh, and how that's structured is building agreement, uh, sorry, contract for sale by the site and a building agreement to build it. So in some cases, just so just say of a 300,000 new build, the um, site purchase would be 50,000 and then the build would be 250,000. So in the two hundred fifty thousand dollars VAT included, which of thirteen and a half percent. So when you're calculating your stamp duty to the government one percent, you can take the fifty thousand off the three hundred. This gives you a two hundred fifty bill cost. You can take thirteen and a half percent off, off the two fifty, right. which would give you you know in and around ten percent, maybe two twenty. We'll call it that. Yeah. That's not an exact figure. 
add on the site value, which is brings it up to two seventy, yeah. and then your stamp duty is one percent of that figure, right. so two thousand seven hundred. So, right, so rather than three hundred k one percent, you're bringing it down. Yeah, so there's usually a saving of between three to five hundred euro in your good. stamp duty if you're buying a new house, Excellent. because the government don't, don't want to double charge you. You're paying stamp duty of uh, sorry duty. On the, uh, on the bill, bills, not the not the land. Correct. Yeah. Back, so you yeah. take that off. So there's always a little calculation oh, there right, to right. do that. And you're entitled to oh, do right, that. Yeah. Excellent. And you pay all those funds to the solicitor. As I said, we act for the aged government, mm-hmm. and we must pay those in a certain time frame. Okay. Oh, excellent. And once it closes. I think for the ease of the interview for people to dissect this at home, because usually when I find watching these videos, it not everyone's going to be in the same situation. And uh, so let's have a quick chat about buying and selling. So let's say you're selling the house. Yeah. And um, just again, maybe so you can just see. Maybe the top to that, so the just, quick just to kind of square off the circle on the purchase. So once okay. you de- once you day you get your keys and we run the searches and everything's happy, the money's transferred over. The sister gets the original title documentation. Yeah. He then or she must then pay your stamp duty online to Revenue Online Services, okay. and there's a process to do that. And then he or she must the solicitor must register use the new owner with the property registration authority. So okay. it's an application to Waterford. You may have the older type title. There's an app the process now to mesh that all in and funnel into the new title where you'll get a folio. So it's like it's Dublin DN one two three four F for free. Hold. There's a map to support that, so we'll take Paul Merriman is selling me a house. I remove Paul's name off it. I know my application. David Sweeney is the new owner. If I have a mortgage now at a bank, I register that bank as the new as the new uh, charge, charge on, on the property. Burden. Once, if you had a mortgage on your property, you're selling to me. You'd pay that mortgage off of the money I pay you. Give me a thing called a vacate. That comes off the folio, so I'm getting a clean folio. This can take like three to six months afterwards. You bought your house. The sister's still working. When we get the the, the completed application back from the. Uh, the red private registration card to the PRA. We then send it. We check them. We do a schedule of documents. We call the certificate title, and we send them back to your bank. So, Mike, if I bought the house, back to my bank, and it's only then that the bank release me from my undertaking. The bank then to keep the, the documents for the next twenty five years till you pay it. Well, <laughs> <laughs> so like, you should I'm not, not sign two pieces of paperwork. Like, like, <laughs> I'm not looking for sympathy for solicitors, yeah, but yeah, I am yeah. saying is that it's a it, lot of work. It, if it, you're it, buying an asset of two hundred and fifty thousand, a quarter of it to be done, million, right? million euro, yeah. like it's not it's not a simple process. No, and it has a lot of weight on it. Like there's people qualified, like conveyancing solicitors, fifteen. Like, you know, just you have to train for eight years to become a solicitor. You know, with yeah. your college training and your legal training, and then even at that, like there's so much variation that come up. With and the experience that obviously exactly. kicks yeah. in different properties. Yeah, and, okay. then, yeah. and then and then you're eventually finished. So that yeah. your fee that you get at the start, like that covers all. Of that you know so from the day you get your, your booking deposit six weeks hopefully si- then sign a contract get your keys then the sister stamps the deed registers your deed sends it back to the bank and they'll they'll send you i'm gonna be honest we've done a yeah. lot of these interviews uh with people for the uh, on the money show and uh, i must say th- th- this is probably being the most informative in relation yeah. to that uh, I'm learning so much yeah. you're talking because we've obviously yeah. known you for quite a while but yeah. I know your sister yeah. you know, but I've never actually sat down with you and actually gone through that whole process yeah. and to be honest with you I'm actually a bit shocked at how much work actually goes on even yeah. after the sale has gone yeah. through yeah. and the client or the customer is sitting in their house six yeah. months later and, and they're still <laughs> signing off paperwork that's it I think when you get your keys and you think that's it you're done Like the solic- and, and the solicitor to, to back it up a small but when you come into the solicitor and sign a contract you'll have your loan off for say 90% of your purchase price pre-agreed with yeah. your bank the solicitor gets a copy there as well and there's special conditions in that now, we're not financial advisors but in broad strokes you'll have the amount the term the repayments yeah. the actual amount it might be up or down it might be a different rate in the middle of it um, you give an undertaking to the bank when you send back that loan offer that you, it's a promise to the bank that you'll drop like you're, you're kind of, in essence you're the middleman because the seller won't give you the keys to the house till you give the, the, the funds and the bank won't give the funds to the, the, the purchaser until yeah. like they're sure that they're buying like a, a proper house the title planning building regulations all that's in place so you give the undertaking the promise that you draw down the mortgage funds uh, you'll buy a house you'll stamp it you'll register it you'll do all the rest of it uh, sometimes then in title things happen especially if you deal with an older title you know an old house back to like 1790s some registry of deeds and there's a senior council opinions sometimes a solicitor you know they can't give the answer that the purchaser wants to hear so what they have to do is like this happens very rarely but it can happen they have to go back to the bank and say listen i can't stand over this purchase there's a little a- anomaly here back 200 years ago and then the, you you give it to the bank, and then the bank review it, and then they give they they will give they'll assess it. Go yeah. ahead, go and that's okay. called a qualification on title. Okay, it doesn't happen a lot, but it is there. So if a sister is not entirely hundred percent comfortable in what's the documents they presented to the seller, to the bank they go back to the bank. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it just might delay the process small, but it doesn't mean they say it can't go through. Okay. But you have a qualification on title. It means that because I have uh, professional indemnity insurances, all sisters have, that if like something is wrong, that potentially there's you know a liability somewhere along the yeah. line if the title is not correct. Okay. Um, yeah, there's a lot in it. Yeah, there is a lot in it. And then just, I suppose, 
we'll, we'll quickly touch on if you're selling a house, uh, and then what I might go on is the mortgage part, you yeah, just touch like, on the bank just, there. I, so let's yeah. say we're selling a house, what's the three things? So this, this, well, I think, the not, thing with, with selling, and it, I, I, <clears throat> especially if you're first time selling, so say you've bought and now you're, you're eight, ten years later, you're either downsizing or upgrading, yeah. so you've never sold before. Um, there's so much involved in a sale. It's actually, it's all in the preparation. Really? All in the preparation. So I would say the minute you're starting to think about selling your house, and that's before you've engaged in auctioneer gone to market, contact your solicitor straight away. Have, a, have, him, have him, him or her in place like six months or a year before you actually go sale agreed. Because there's about, we work, we work out about maybe just 10 to 15 things that you'd have in place. So the simple things. One is copy of ID uh, and anti-money on, proof of address. Just yeah. have those simple things ready. Second of all, uh, if you're married, copy your marriage cert. Okay. If you're separated, divorce, marriage cert, any of your divorce agreement, because okay. that's all affecting now under the family law legislation having to sell it on. Okay. You must have all your local property tax paid on the property, uh, the LPT, that was formerly the household charge up to 2012. And when you're selling a house, you must, so say we're, you're selling a house, you hope to do so within the calendar year of 2019. So say you're, you're going to go sell the house, uh, complete it in June. You pay the whole local property tax last November for, until the end of 2019. And then on the day you sell, the purchasers will refund you back the pro rata at the end of the year that you, that you haven't paid yourself. So like an average local property is probably anywhere from 190 to 300,000, sorry, 190 to 300 euro based on the property yeah. house. So if you paid the 300 for the year, they'll refund you back 106 oh, yeah, euro. Yeah, yeah, soon, yeah. Uh, how many days out of 365? Okay. Um, there's a thing called the NPPR. I don't know if remember this tax that came in, non-principal mm -hmm. price residue tax. It's no longer in the country, but it's, it's held up so many sales uh, since in the last, since the property market started to move again last four, three or four years. So what it was, is it's a tax coming between 2009 and 2013. Yeah. The government taxed people who had second homes. So if you had a holiday home, if you had a yeah, uh, rent rental property, whatever it might be. Second so the home. NPP, or non principal price residence tax, it went in 2013. But if you're selling your house now and the property that you're selling, you must do one of two things. One, give a receipt, if it, if it was in your principal private residence, second home, that you paid the tax back in 2009, 2013. So you must really? have the four Even receipts go back for four to yeah. You cannot sell that house unless you have a receipt. I'm assuming you can get that receipt from somewhere because no well, one's going to have it in the drawer. Well, you, well, hopefully you paid it because it was an amnesty brought out a couple of years ago and you didn't pay within that amnesty. There's a penalty. I think it's somewhere around 7,000 euro now to actually get that to sell it. And the second uh, part of it that if you, even if this is this is the real head wrecker, even if you want to call it that, uh, is that even if this is your family home and you didn't have to pay the tax, you must have a sort of exemption for those years to say that your house didn't qualify, you didn't have to pay the tax, 2009, 10, 11, 12, 13. This is every residential property in the country. Well, and what that means is that you, contact, you as a seller has to contact the local county council and you have to ask them for the, the certificate of exemption and sometimes they might ask you to say, prove you're living there. And so it's 2019 now. go back now and try and get an ESB bill or something ten, yeah, from 10 oh, years ago, which is now, a disaster. Worst case scenario, you can the county council may give a declaration from the seller to say, listen, I'm giving you an oath here. I was living at the time. Right. I had no other property. And that can be backed up by a solicitor's declaration as well in certain cases. Okay. But it, it's certainly, like, if you think about that, dealing with county council, it doesn't happen today or tomorrow. Like, that's a week, a month's process. So you should get going with your... Uh, okay, your, that's brilliant. Sell, that's that's that excellent. But if you're, team, you're thinking of selling, contact the solicitor, make get sure all, your all tax that things are in place. Because you cannot sell a property away. without sending tax. The, the seller, because the purchasing system will make sure that all that's that in place. That is all in order, yeah. So you're selling, you make sure everything's clean. The second part then is your title deed. So where are the titles? So if you have mortgage, they're with the bank. They're with the bank. So yeah. you must send up an authority from your solicitor, signed, giving a consent for the bank to release them to your solicitor to draft okay. contracts if you go sale agreed. Or if you've no mortgage, you might have under the mattress at home yeah. or somewhere on yeah. top yeah. of the wardrobe. Get them together. If you have a mortgage on the property that's with the bank, get your redemption figure. Get that now so that if you're going to sale agreed at 300,000, the mortgage is well, 180. Well, you know, you can afford a case a bit of a, you have a you get yeah. tight on the move or whatever you're doing. Yeah, exactly. Or it's not a negative equity kind of type kind of transaction yeah. where you need to consent to your bank or there's other properties cross secure, it might be something like that. And also, the purchasing solicitor will want to see a copy of the redemption figure. We can't just say, listen, we're grand. I actually, if I'm selling it, I have to send them a copy of the redemption from the bank. Okay. Within reasonable time frame, um, at least 14, usually 14 days from the day to say, but great. From the start of the process, it, it might just be out, but you're not going to, you know, you know, they're in yeah. the ballpark of the sales figure. Um, so you have your, yeah, and then if, so I spoke about previously, if, um, you know, if you bought the property single person, now you're married. Yeah. Uh, and also if it's an apartment, you know, is the management company still in place? Is, it Has, is the developer? Well, yeah, is there yeah. service charges? Is there management fees? Yeah. All that kind of I, stuff. I actually noticed is a few things that come up now recently with these apartment blocks. The fire starts. Is that another issue where they might have fell out with the management company and they can't sell then, really? You know, yeah. so it's going to let well, a customer boy or a, a client boy 
without the fo- well, sorry, it can be done, but it's not the best thing in the world to be recommended. Uh, definitely, if there's a bank involved, you'll yeah. have to go back to the bank and the bank make that decision you spoke of earlier. Okay. If you're a cash purchaser, uh, as a solicitor, you would be writing to him strongly advise him not to buy this property. Okay. And strongly going in the strongest terms, you cannot you can't buy this property. It's it's, it's not if there was a fire here, yeah. not only the personal hazard, but like structurally, yeah. You've well, no, especially you're over a bite to let or something as well, because you're going to be right. Yeah, you're and you, right exactly, you won't get insurance yeah. either. You know yeah. your house insurance on it. Um, okay. Yeah. So like, there's a lot involved. So My advice for selling, selling to start now, yeah. and then agree your fees with the seller. So there's a slightly less fees with if you're selling than if you're buying because there's no stamp duty or registration. But you still agree that the legal fee plus VAT from the outset. Especially where the legal fee is less. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. So the overall fee is less because you're not paying the stamp duty. You're not, you're not yeah, paying, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, yeah. You don't have to uh, kind of yeah. budget for that. Yeah. Okay. Very good. So once you've done all that, right? Well, what I will say, there is value for money out there. You know, you can see what the solicitor does and they have, you know, staff and people running your oh, files every day. Yeah. Um, but get get the fixed price up front and yeah. shop around and see what value is out there and what you can do. Um, and then it be, you pass over to your auctioneer, it goes to market and then they, into the negotiation and you go sell agreed. And then at that stage, then hopefully the solicitor has all the, the title documentation to hand. He can Great. draft the contracts. Um, and then he, he can just, he or she can then deal with then the, the purchasing solicitor on the other side. Right, brilliant. So look, that's the kind of buying a house, first time buyer we spoke about. Oh, sorry. The likes of there's, the one, there's one other thing, but you're auction, if you're selling, but your auctioneer will probably advise you that's the BR cert. Oh so yeah, every residential property. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just, that's just the energy rate. It's a couple hundred quid or something. Yeah, there was a right? big thing a couple of years ago where we thought, wow, this is going to be, people became qualified BR yeah. certs, um, not even engineers, technicians, technicians yeah, remember was, but it never really came of anything. You get yeah. 150 to 200 euros. Usually, the auctioneer or someone connected to the Has, habit, yeah, we'll but we okay. can't sell the house. We can't sell it. Okay. Now, if you bought it previously in the last 10 or 15 years, the, the old BS art will still be our cert. Will we'll still, still do it. Why? All right, okay. We may not have it, so you must have a BR right. cert. Okay. So. so, when we go through everything, we talked about the first time buyers, we talked about buyers, first hand property, second hand property, we talked about selling property. You've tipped on this now already, I mean, you've mentioned the banks. Yeah. So, from, from my side of the fence on these, the poor people buying houses, whether through a mortgage, usually with a mortgage or with cash, the one thing when it comes to a mortgage, I always find delays the process is the life insurance policy. Yeah. And that's one thing we always recommend someone do get yeah. ASAP, get an assignment yeah. done. Because a lot of yeah. people that have come to the last day, yeah. they go into their keys and the life policy is in the bank and it causes yeah. But from your point of view, from the legal point of view, yeah. what usually. I suppose messes people up or yeah. delays people unnecessarily yeah. when dealing with banks. Well, yeah. What's so, the usual things you see? I suppose, like 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 everything else. So if you're purchasing, you just want your keys. You want that day where you can you yeah. know open the key, your brand new house, your family home, live happily ever after. But when so say you've gone say the agreed with your auctioneer, mm-hmm. and in the background you know in your in your head you've been like pre-approved or your approval principle with your bank. Yes. So that's where you have your budget from, and then you go say the agreed, and then the the bank issue the loan offer to the solicitor to the amount yeah. that matches up ninety percent or whatever might be agreed with the actual purchase price. And then at that time, I spoke about it earlier about the sister having an undertaking. He must satisfy or she satisfy things to the bank, the yeah. title planning and that. So we call them the internal. So the bank have internal things that we must satisfy. So as a solicitor, he gives up the he or she gives up the signed loan offer, the, the undertaking, the client retainer, the client the uh, client giving authority for that solicitor yeah. act from this transaction, carry out all that, a check requisition form. So we're actually drawing down the funds yeah. on the closing date or in advance of the closing date. Um, and there may be one or two other things. So say the person might be getting a gift from a parent. You'd have to get a declaration from the parent that they. They're not been forced to give this money over. Yes, but also yeah, that yeah. Th- it is a gift, and the parent is not is not ex- there's no expectation, or, you know, no expectation of, title, alone, of yeah. title or anything. They'll have no ownership. Oh, okay, more. Okay, so more the solicitor satisfies all that stuff, and they must do all that. And then the the purchaser, either through the broker or the branch, their their ID, the standing order, the life insurance, the house insurance. And so what happens there? It is a bit of an anomaly because you can't actually take insurance out on something until you, until you don't own it. Mm. So we get asked this all the time: When should I have my house insurance and my and my life insurance? But the bank won't allow the drawdown, which is the release yeah. of the funds, to the solicitor until all that's well, in place. Well, we usually do it for life insurance. You can't do it for house insurance. Life insurance, if it's say you're borrowing the mortgage for thirty years, we usually set a thirty-one year policy. So someone's planning to buy in the next year and they've identified yes. in the next six months they come yeah, for the loan approval. Right we get the life policy yeah. in place straight away. So yeah. if it's a, if it's thirty-year terms or thirty-one yeah. year terms, it costs yeah. an extra tw- yeah. twenty cent or something yeah. to make that extra year on yeah. some policies. Yeah. Uh, so it's always proven they have to make sure it's there. But I suppose see, the banks won't release the funds till they have that. No, of course they won't. Yeah, exercise. It's a it's a and then, as a solicitor, we draw down the mortgage, and then if there's like balance funds to be paid from the purchaser, and they must pay the fees and the revenue and all that, yeah. and the registration fees before they get their keys. But 
uh, tr traditionally, we would close the house on a Friday. It's good luck to get your keys on a Friday. So right. most conveyances would close on a Friday afternoon. Oh, would they? Yeah, yeah and the solicitor would either the purchasing solicitor would visit the office of the selling solicitor and do that transaction over a table, or more than often not now you just do it by post and the, all the funds because of anti fraud and that would be electronically transferred because solicitors don't take checks and they don't take bank drafts anymore oh, right. because it's not instantaneous. Um, but so if we're closing on the Friday. I, I only want your funds if you're buying in my client account on the Wednesday at the very earliest. I don't want those funds sitting in my account a week or two before. Because the clients charge interest well, you, <laughs> Correct, but you're going to start paying it a month from that date. Yeah, exactly. You can't yeah. adjust the date to suit your wages yeah, and all that. Yeah, but you're still on interest from that but date. But I just don't mind having that in my, yeah. in my account for two weeks because there's the, so I want it in my account on the Wednesday, out to the other solicitors on the Thursday, they have it then and we close it on the Friday. Friday. And that's all done, that's bonded by the law society. The other solicitor holds those funds and trust upon the purchasing, the selling solicitor's instruction and they can't release that to the purchaser until I'm happy I have all the, if I'm acting for the purchaser, all the documents and all that kind of stuff, all my right, searches brilliant. are done and all that. Right, very good. Yeah. Excellent. Um, but so, so just on, on the one thing you tipped on, uh, one thing you touched on there, Rudder, uh, two things. You, you mentioned these uh, quickly. One was an AIP and one was a loan offer. So I think for the viewers, you might just go back over what they are and, and how they affect, because there's a bit of a time difference in yeah. those two pieces of documentation. Yeah. So uh, you might as well, you might as well fire away with that if you want. So uh, like the so proven principle? Yeah, so you prove principles. Yeah, that's the document that's, that you... That's kind of like a financial aspect. So if, and I'm not a financial advisor, but in, in broad strokes, like, like we said before, it's kind of like your budget and your, the location yeah, it's your of your house. It's from the bank to say that yeah. you're being qualified, you've given us all this information, you give a certain amount of criteria, oh, a certain level. and we're giving you, say, 300 grand, back yeah. to that 300 grand example. Yeah. But then, yeah, obviously, the way the loan offer comes out to the solicitor then, so yeah. maybe that's when you kind of more get involved. Yeah, so you, you, you know, know from offer. the start of the process, and I think some of these approval and principles, like a loan offer, it, it actually they used to last for 12 months. They've kind of been narrowed down yeah, a bit to 12, has, six yeah. months yeah. or three months, depending. And why that's really significant on a, on a borrower is that your job might change you know you, might, you have yeah. to reassess and so like yeah. and also you your might, wife get, might be pregnant your house you might have to go maternity leave your, 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 your house might be ready or you might fail yeah. on the bidding yeah. process or yeah. the other side could so you could easily find yourself all, yeah. all going home yeah. and something can happen inside your control yeah. but then you go back and probably get a re another loan offer so which is a nightmare. what's really important there is once you have your like approval and principle when that's kind of your budget where you can work off and maybe your target where you yeah. can go to and come back from and then when you go sale degree the loan offer must be sent the, the actual loan offer, depending on the, the solicitor. you know leverage and correctly leverage the house you're buying, but the solicitor one. When I spoke previously, like the three main stages: the booking deposit, contract, and then your keys. We cannot, we will not advise you, or you won't sign your contract until the loan offer is in, in the office okay. as well. So you'd sign those both to two contracts both days because we, we don't want you to sign a contract and the loan offer falls through and yep. then you're stuck into a contract. Yep. A legal obligation to buy the house and vice versa like we need to have there's no point signing a loan offer if we can't have our contract in place so they're contemporaneous and dependent on each other and so you sign your contract and you sign your loan offer on the same day and then all those documents go up to the bank now we don't have to draw down the loan straight away but we can start the process of like, getting the direct debit getting the life insurance getting your property insurance in place and the solicitor can start they would usually hold back everything give all the documents except the check, check requisition right okay. the actual date i want the funds on like 24th of april right. or it might be Right, yeah, very good. Yeah. So just one other thing, I think kind of to square off, you know, the, the conveyance in question, whether it's like buying a house, first time buyer, the help to buy, stamp duty, all that, and if you're selling a house, just getting prepared, is like, we would really advise anybody who's buying property, or if you have young children, to have a will. I know we discussed yeah. on it briefly earlier, yeah. you, sh you yeah. should just have a will in place. It's so important. Now, if you're married, and you, God forbid, something happened to you, under succession act 1965 and that's kind of the the kind of historic and centralized piece of legislation in ireland which dictates what happens properly after you die yeah um the probate is the name for that so we spoke about conveyancing being the yeah. property uh, name the legal name but probate is what's called um when we deal with wills and, and that and estates are passed exactly and yeah and, and so we would advise everybody to have a will especially if, if you property because it just yes if you if you government something happens you pass it's when easier, you property it's quicker if you have a will it can be like it'll still go to your next of kin under what's called a letter of administration. Yeah. So instead of having a grant to probate, that's the process. There's yeah. a will, and you apply to the High Court and the Revenue Commissioners, it's supporting application, all that kind of stuff, uh, just to see if there's any gift tax. And we spoke earlier of the Revenue.ie, yeah. a great website, and that's where you can find out thresholds. So there's no yeah. tax if, uh, from spouse to spouse, yeah. and then from parent to child, it goes to ABC the and all that. Yeah. Tax, yeah. It gets narrower, narrower, narrower. Um, so you should have a will of your property because if you want to will something outside of your spouse or it, all that kind of stuff, you might want to. In general terms, if you're married, if some one spouse predeceased the other, all property go to surviving spouse, and then yeah. simultaneously there's some that go to children, even shares. I think everybody should have a will. If you have property, if you have young children, especially 
you know, the, the family dynamic in Ireland now is, is not it's the traditional shady. family we know, yeah, we know it's about. It's every type of relationship, mm-hmm. whether it's homosexual, heterosexual, every type of like adoption, stepchildren, you know, yeah. Yeah, second marriages, it's, it's all there. So like, and you should have a will that reflects that. So like, uh, my advice is meet your solicitor, get your will done. Yeah. Uh, so if you have property, so you, you can dictate after your death what's actually happening in your assets. Mm-hmm. But it's really important if you have young children. I might, like, this is really morbid conversation to have because yeah. it means that both parents passed away. I know, yeah. That if it, you don't have a will, talk about, we need to do it. Like, like we, we've, we've done like hundreds and hundreds of wills and these type of wills where we've often had predominantly the wife or the mother of the children gets upset in these circumstances because yeah. you're thinking of a really, you know, a dramatic, event. traumatic yeah, event. Yeah. But you, you should do it. You should do it, yeah. Um, a couple of reasons. One, like if you don't have a will and both parents pass away and your children are 18, they can potentially go into the care of state. Yeah. Now, in normal circumstances, the family, the family will take, take in them. and logic but presumes, but you get, yeah, yeah, but you, you, you want to make sure there's not a family feud either, for correct, presuming this. Correct, and that, that's, make sure that, that it's a sister time. you want, the brother and the brother or whatever, it's very over the kids. And then like, even in like, outside of the family situation of the children, and when you're making will, you know, they say, where's a will, is a relative. Yeah. You know, so like, no, you're not particularly very clear. Depends on how good your kids are though. Maybe people that want them. Happens all the time. But there is a thing under section at 1965 called this, the legal right share and that means that you cannot legally leave your spouse out of your will yes. and, you, and there's actually a third of your estate for your children right, okay. but if you have five children they get a fifth of a third so right. if you've left out one of those children they can, and you have five kids they can take they must take a court application to do it right. to get one fifteenth of that estate if you, if you know what I mean right, okay. but uh, to defence that gifts in a lifetime yeah. can actually satisfy gifts after pro- now these are very mm. exceptional but it does yeah, happen it does happen uh, yeah. but just if you have young children uh, there's a couple. Of, so on any will, anyway, you must appoint an executor, and that's someone who looks over your estate with the solicitor to make sure you know it's all been carried out in terms of your will. If there's an expense, to be signed off at the end, and make sure then that the terms were carried out in accordance with the terms of the testator, someone who makes a will. Right. That's in every will. So then, if it's your spouse and they survive, you usually your, your spouse is the survive, so yeah. the executor as well. So in the, in the case of uh, simultaneous death and both parents are uh, passed away. You nominate an executor. So there's three roles. I'm talking here now. If you have a person who has young children under yeah. age of 18, three people you must identify. One is the executor. That's someone, and this, this can be the same person. Yeah. Three distinct roles. So the executor is the financial person while the solicitor is extracting the grant to probate. So maybe we need a signature to write to the bank, write to the pension company, make sure all the funds are in, and then it distributed, sign off on the grant to probate, the expectation itself, and the, what's called the CA24 form. form. Uh, Previously, you'd make an application to the Revenue Commission to say, listen, this estate is worth 500,000 euro. I want you to stamp that certified, come back to me, so then I'll make my application to the probate office okay. and take out the grant. Right, okay. Now you do that together. It's all done together. So you, you put your Revenue Commissioner form with, with the probate application, you send that to the, the High Court, really. And what that is, that the High Court is confirming, yes, this person has passed away, we're confirming the debt cert and all that is in order, and we're giving permission, the Irish estate is giving permission for the... the, the the estate to be distributed in comes in okay, terms of will. Yeah. And why you have the revenue stamp on it, that, that means that if there is stamp, like if a gift that tax, tax or something like that. Yeah, then yeah. that, that's where the, that's where that figure has come from. So if you're getting 20% of that estate and you're, there's taxable, and as we said earlier, revenue.e is great. Yeah. So that's your executor. They oversee that, sign it off at the end, pay off uh, like the funeral guy and all that kind of stuff, and that's all clean and tidied up at the end of it. That could take a year after someone dies for the, the probate process to, to take place. The second role then, uh, sorry, the second and third role are quite, they're related, but they are different. One is the trustee and one is a guardian. So the guardian is that someone you appoint, take care of the welfare of the child. So who's going to step into your shoes that day? Yeah. Wh- who's going to feed them? Who's going to clothe them? Who's going to look after them? Give them accommodation. So that's, it's generally like a sister and a brother and sister-in-law on yeah, either side. Yeah. Like I, we would advise two people, but the guardian may be one person. On the second role, the trustee, uh, the, sorry, this distinction of the, the guardian is the welfare of the child and that yeah. kind of day-to-day care. The trustee is someone, it's more of a financial aspect to it, mm-hmm. where just say that the family home has to be sold and the, the children would, are going to live with the aunt or live with the guardian. So the, the proceeds of that the sale... The trustee will make sure that that money goes... Correct. Yeah. So the proceeds of that sale, say the house sold, the house sold for 400000 that goes into a fund known as a trust yes, fund. The and kids, then the trustee yeah. will yeah. access that. We would recommend two people as trustees, so yeah. there's a bit of joint discussion there access that fund for the benefit of the children, for education, for the accommodation, yep. their welfare, whatever it might be, up to a certain age you decide then you want your kids to have control And this of is, it. I suppose, very important. We recommend this for clients who are putting in life insurance contracts to make sure that, oh, that yeah. the will is there yeah. for that reason because yeah. obviously you're taking a life insurance contract, you don't yeah. want to think about yeah. passing away, yeah. but it's there in case you do. So yeah. you might have one or two kids and they might have five or six or seven hundred K coming towards them when they're yeah. 18 unless yeah. it's something yeah. in the will or in the trust to say, a lot of people you can't get it till you're 25 or 30, Correct. you'll get a bit yeah. of 21 yeah. and another bit of 25 if yeah. the trustees deem responsible. Yeah. So it's prudent to make sure, yeah. in my opinion, 
as well as yours, obviously. 100% That right. the will is there, and no matter whether it's a life insurance contract, an old pension, yeah. or a property, obviously. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Like yeah. most, what we're finding is most people for their children is they're saying 23. That's yes. the age third level education finishes. So it can be any age over 18. I actually once had I a, a definitely man. wouldn't have had the actual... <laughs> no, I wasn't at 23 and 18. <laughs> not at 23. I had a gentleman in and he said 35. Yeah. Because he judged yeah, it, on his yeah. own experience yeah. and he had her, inherited money himself and he wasn't responsible. 100%. So it can be any age over, over 18. Yeah. Most people say 18, 23. Because mm. that's when the third level, like most people go to third level college yeah, or they, whatever that might be or that's yeah. a trade or a work experience at, at 23. And then if you have five five children, it's as the oldest person, it's each one hits the age. Yeah, that age so when I hit 20, 23, I get my your fifth sh- and what's your left, share, and, then, yeah. and, then, and, then, and then it goes you, up. You yeah. have your brothers and sisters nagging you for a few quid. <laughs> <laughs> or driving around in my little sporty car or whatever. Um, uh, but yeah, that, that's yeah, practically so we, how we, it works. Yeah, but so it, it that's is, why it's important. You really have to think about who are, who are those people. And we find a lot of the time, you know, there's a lot of non-nationals living in Ireland now, so you might have someone in Poland and they might want their parents from Poland to come over, but we need to nominate someone in the country right here, right now. Um, and then we often get the question as well, if you have an executor, a guardian, a trustee, and that person dies, what happens? Yeah. Can we make a new will? It's very clean, because you're like, you're, yeah. you've survived that person. Make a new will, readjust, mm-hmm. rethink what you want to happen. Most of this is, it's like, Make a will is, n- is nominal, you know, it's, there's not much to there's, cost. There's not much will. cost. A couple yeah. hundred euro, yeah. you know, a hundred euro plus fat, usually, or whatever. If it gets a bit more complex, it might be a bit more drafting time. It's not, no, for, for, for the peace of mind, uh, for the so, estate, where things are on smooth, yeah. there's anything wrong, no, it's, it's like, a no-brainer. I just really broad stroke that. So my advice no, is that if you have yeah. property or young children, sit down Sit down with your sister, go through the process. It's probably two meetings. Or how we do it is like we email out a questionnaire, you fill out the questionnaire, have a back voice, and when you come in then... If it's not, if we need to have a proper like uh, attendance then, and then we come back and then we have the okay. will draft. So it's usually two meetings. So David, th- 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 thanks very much, first of all, for the well, the, the amount of information you've given me, first of all. I'm actually well, blown you, away, you know, and I hope I the viewers are yeah, as well. Because what these series are about, the On The, on the Money Show is supposed to be about bringing people like yourself, experts, into the field, uh, to, to, right into the camera for people to try and get a better understanding of how yeah. it works and to understand and appreciate it probably a little bit more. And obviously, if anyone wants to contact you, maybe, where, yeah. where, can, we, where can people get you? Yeah, thanks very much. Well, I hope I have been of, of some help. Yeah. You know, there was, there was a lot of information in all of that, and some of it is quite narrow and specific, yeah. and some of it, you know, like the wheels, so we probably need to sit down with somebody. Uh, we have growing our social media profiles, so Sweeney Slicers, we're on Instagram, we're on Facebook. Uh, LinkedIn, great. You can find us on Twitter as well. Right, yeah, and or you know, old school email info to your sisters. He and we've Cork and Dublin office. We'd love to speak to anyone if we take it take it off here in a private great. conversation. Perfect. Uh, any way we can. And we'd love to, I'd love to have uh, some referrals from yourself. Anybody yeah. who's watching this, would be too happy to help them out. Yeah, perfect. Just mentioned the uh, Ask Paul name. I'm sure yeah. you'll look after him. Uh, awesome you will, yeah. the TLC there. Yeah. Listen, David. Thanks for me. That was brilliant. Really Thank enjoyable. You. Thanks so Thank much. You very yeah, much. Have a great day. Thanks. Thank you. Cheers. Bye.